grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Sit down. <laughs> Have you ever wondered why some people hear the gospel and believe it while others do not? Why some people who have been baptized into Christ and made members of the body of Christ later so reject the faith or drift away and speak about those days when they went to church as something in the distant past. The parable of the sower of the seed is much to say in answer to these questions. There are reasons why the Holy Spirit is unsuccessful with some and not others. Jesus narrows the reasons for the failures down to three general categories lack of understanding, failure to persevere, and getting tangled up in all of life's trials, troubles, and temptations. And so we're gonna look briefly at each one of these three barriers to faithful living, but before we do that, I wanna be sure and very careful with you that you understand here that Jesus is not, N-O-T, not, identifying three different types of people as he looks out over this great crowd that is gathered around him. Three different types of people as if, as if it were possible after he's all said and done for us to come away saying, oh, how glad I am that I don't have that particular problem. I might have this one, but I don't have that one. And I am glad that I am not like that sinner. I might be like this one, but not that one. Only the fourth example, the one about the good seed on the good soil, only there do we finally lift up our heads and then say, oh, that's me he's talking about there. Actually, actually what Jesus is describing is what he sees in this great crowd gathered around him in each and every one of those people. All of these forces, all three of these forces negatively are at work, both from within and from without all of these folks, including the small crowd of people gathered around him in these pews today. So the beauty of this parable, beauty of this parable, by the time we get to the end of it, the stunning good news of this parable is that despite all of the hard-packed, rocky, thorny hearts that Jesus sees in this great crowd, he nonetheless, nonetheless, sows his seed. He keeps sowing his seed, and he keeps sowing his seed, and in fact, despite all of the forces that work against a successful crop in and on each and every one of these people, he scatters his seed, his word, liberally. Because he knows that his word is like the rain and the snow that come down from heaven. It will accomplish its purpose. It will produce its fruit. And with that, with that, by the time we're all said and done here, we're left not with judging whether or not we are good or bad soil, but rather with relying entirely upon Jesus to sow his precious seed in us. And despite all of our weakness and our failures and our faults, we pray that he might nonetheless, despite us, produce his wonderful crop in us. A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path and were trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. Later, with his disciples, Jesus explains, Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes, and he takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. So very often, the word of God is simply misunderstood among us. 
St. Paul says that the word is the power of God, the dunamis, the dynamite of God, unto salvation for all who believe. And I think that it's right about there, right about there where the misunderstanding just begins to take place among us. The word of God is powerful, but it is not magical. And frankly, we would rather it be magical than powerful. We'd rather the word was like a magic wand that would touch us and turn us from frogs into handsome princes or beautiful princesses, or more to the point of the parable, turn us into a child of God. We wish that we could just give somebody a Bible and say Jesus is Lord and abracadabra, just like that, in a flash of smoke. We got a Christian, voila, works every time. But that's not how the word works. The word works both instantly and slowly at the same time. It creates faith in our heart at the very moment of our baptism as the Holy Spirit takes up residence in us. But then he slowly, steadily, methodically works to plow up in us that hard-packed soil, which is all of those expectations as to just how God should work in us, as if we were the ones telling God how he should work in us. The shovel digs deep and he turns us over and he chops up all of those stubborn clods in our life. And then comes the rake, and he drags us back and forth and back and forth, hacking away at all of those lumps and exposing the rocks and the sticks that all have to go. It's a painful process, and the process goes on and on and on all throughout our life. And all the time that this is going on, the devil is at work. Sometimes he's whispering, sometimes he's shouting, sometimes he's screaming at us. Look at how your God is treating you. If God were really the loving God that he says that he is, do you really think that he'd treat you like this? Do you think that he really cares about you? Look at the way he's treating you. Look at the pain. Look at the suffering in your life. Look at the turmoil. Listen to me. Listen to me. If I was you, if I was you, I would get off this track and I would take another. I would quit this business of faith altogether and get out of this hard packed soil and take the easy road. But today, here, amongst this crowd gathered around him, we hear the sower himself say, no, this is how the word works. Slowly, over time, it's painful, it's hard for us to go along with it. It's not easy to be plowed up. It's not easy to be turned over, to be broken, to be raped. And yet, that is just what God's word promises to do if we will let it. And that is why, that is why we wish that this whole thing were more magical than powerful. And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And Jesus explains the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But th these have no root. They believe for a while, and in time of testing, they fall away. More misunderstanding going on here. I thought that when I became a Christian, everything would go well for me and life would be happy, happy, happy all the time. But I've been a believer now for a whole six weeks and it seems like my problems now are just greater than they were beforehand. I'm going to chuck this whole thing. I thought that if I started to go back to church, all my struggles would be over. I'd start to get my life back again. It's been two whole years now. I've joined the altar guild. I've taught Sunday school. I even brought a nice jello salad to the last potluck supper. And you know what? I just got laid off from my job. Forget this religion. 
If ever there was a point in, in a parable that applied especially to us Americans, this is it. We like to measure the meaning and the purpose and the satisfaction of our lives in terms of how much happiness and how much success we get. We want fast action, we want instant results. And so when things don't go right and trouble comes along, what do we do? We grab the nearest crucifix, we shake it at the sky, and we say, this thing doesn't work, and throw it away. And once again, we can just smell the stench of the devil's breath breathing close. But the sower of the seed tells us that the Holy Spirit works through his word slowly over time to produce a deep-rooted faith. And as strange and as counterintuitive as it may sound, it is precisely in the suffering that the deep roots are formed. Suffering produces perseverance, says St. Paul. Trials, tribulations, troubles, suffering, all of these work to transform a shallow faith into a deeply rooted trust in the word and promise of God. Tough times are the times that teach us that the word and promise of God are utterly reliable and worthy of our trust. Without suffering and trials, the whole thing, the whole thing just becomes theoretical, waiting to be disproved. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it. And Jesus explains that as for what was sown among the thorns, they are those who hear, but they are choked by the cares and the riches and the pleasures of life. So after a, what I thought was a full career in the pastoral ministry, but here I, I'm having a hard time retiring, I think. <laughs> I can honestly say that only rarely have I ever had anyone come to me saying that he could go no further with this whole matter of Christianity because intellectually they disagree with it. Very occasionally someone has said to me, I just can't buy this whole business of a virgin giving birth to a child or a dead man raising himself from the grave, or the creation of the world in six 24-hour days. But sadly, I can't even begin to count how many have said to me, sometimes not in words, but in deeds, in one way or the other, that they can go no farther with this life of faith in Christ because, because, because it just interferes too much with something else going on in their life. And whatever those something else's are, they are always more important than Jesus. And before you and I say, phew, I'm glad that's not us, because we're here, we're sitting in church, we're enduring this sermon. I would ask you, are there not places in each one of our lives where we have drawn the line and said, this word may not take root here. We say that it may uproot this weed, move out this rock, but this area or that area of my life is off limits to his word. Jesus, you can have everything except this one thing. I am not willing to forfeit my standard of living or my private life or my pet pleasures. This is where I draw the line. And again, let me repeat, these are not three different types of people our Lord is pointing to here. He is pointing to the forces that are at work in each and every one of us, all of us, from the inside and from the out all of the time. And so thankfully, huh? Thankfully, this is not the end of the parable. 
And some seed fell on good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold, which Jesus interprets to mean, as for the seed in good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. And I know, I know because I'm there, right with you, that each of us, as we hear these words, are ready to breathe a big sigh of relief. Finally, finally he's talking about me. But then we hear those words, who hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and something just makes us twitch and catch our breath. Because we know that we are the one who do not understand, who are impatient. We fail to persevere. We are the ones who get all tangled up in the distractions and the diversions that surround us. And we are the ones who fall away again and again and over and over. We are not the ones who hear these words and hold them fast in an honest and a good heart. And I will say to you that if you will permit it, in fact, if you will allow it, it is right here, and only right here, where we begin to find ourselves in the good soil. It is right here and only right here where we are finally now ready to hear and believe that it is not we who are the good soil at all, but the one who is telling this parable. He is the one who hears the word and holds it fast in a good and honest heart and who bears fruit with patience. He is the one who not only hears the word, but who is the word, and yet was trampled underfoot who fell among the thorns that encircled his head, who cries, I thirst because there was no water to nourish him. And not because he did not understand, not because he got tangled up in the riches and the cares and the pleasures of life, not because he failed to persevere. No, the one who tells this parable endures all of this for you in your place in your stead as your substitute. It is Jesus Christ and him alone who is the good soil. And you were planted in him in your baptism and watered with the Holy Spirit. And the word continues to be sown into your ears where the hard-packed soil has been broken and plowed by his holy absolution. I forgive you all of your sins. He regularly fertilizes you with his very body and blood in the Holy Supper. And the day is coming, dear friends. The day is coming when your body will fall into the ground like a seed that is planted until you will wake up again in his new creation where all of the hard-packed, rocky, thorny soil has been transformed into the very Garden of Eden. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace where the mountains and the hills before you break into singing and all of the trees of the field clap their hands where instead of thorns shall come up cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. But until then, until that day when you hear the Lord's voice call you out of the ground, come, come to me, until then, you remember that you have been planted in good soil, the good soil of Jesus Christ, and you bloom where you are planted. He who has ears to hear, let him hear.